From DLA Piper, this is the Beyond the Curve podcast. In this episode, Jackie Park, the firm's U.S. co-managing partner, and Kara Edwards, co-chair of the firm's Leadership Alliance for Women, talk with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Joanne Lublin about the challenges and opportunities seen by working mothers. I'm Jackie Park, and I'm joined today by Joanne Lublin and Kara Edwards. Joanne is the former management news editor for The Wall Street Journal and a current contributor. She was The Wall Street Journal's career advice columnist for nearly 30 years. I'm sure she's got some stories and shared the journal's Pulitzer Prize for stories about corporate scandals, probably even better stories. She has written two phenomenal books. Her new book is titled Power Moms, How Executive Mothers Navigate Work and Life. And her first book was titled Earning It, Hard-Won Lessons from Trailblazing Women at the Top of the Business World. In Power Moms, Joanne compares two generations of women, boomers and Gen Xers, to examine how each navigates the emotional and professional challenges involved in juggling managerial careers and families. And that's what we'll be talking about here today. Joanne, in your new book, Power Moms, you write that for the first time in American history, a significant number of mothers are heading major corporations, and that over the past several decades, women have made significant gains throughout executive suites. You were actually part of the first wave of Power Moms when you were pursuing your Wall Street Journal career after you had two children. Tell us about your own experience as a working mother. Well, thank you first very much for hosting me and having this program. I think we've got a lot of ground to cover and your listeners will find it very interesting. In my own case, I chose to become a parent after struggling for many years as to whether I really wanted to be a mother because I didn't have any role models at the Wall Street Journal. There weren't any working moms that I knew of in the news department And there also weren't any women managers in prominent positions, whether they had kids or not. But ultimately, I did decide that I wanted at least one child because it seemed to me a life experience that I didn't want to miss. And it was something that my husband and I really wanted to do. So I had my first child, my son, in 1979. And when I announced my pregnancy at the Wall Street Journal, it turned out there were half a dozen women in the news department who all announced their pregnancies within a two-week period. The then (laughs) managing editor, who had a stay-at-home wife, just about tore out his very few remaining hairs and said, this was not in my job description. What am I supposed to do now? (laughs) But to my dismay, only two of those six women, myself and a reporter in the New York Bureau, decided that they were going to come back after maternity leave. And that other reporter who did come back only stayed for a few months. Mm. So there I was, a new mom after giving birth in August of 1979 and coming back in late 79. And not only alone, but isolated. And like you said, trailblazing because I was finding my way through the wilderness. Mm. There's a saying that I've heard over the years that if you can see it, you can be it. So for you, you didn't see it. So how did you decide that you could be it? Well, I decided I could be it just the way I decided I could be a journalist at the Wall Street (laughs) Journal who was a woman. Because when I was hired by the Wall Street Journal in 1971, after finishing graduate school, I was the first female reporter hired full time in the San Francisco Bureau. At the time, there were roughly about a dozen women in the news department. And to again, show you how far we've come in the last 50 years, and it will be 50 years this summer since I was hired, the highest ranking woman at the Wall Street Journal at that time was a copy editor. Mm -hmm. And when she got engaged to a more senior guy at the paper, they called them into the senior editor's offices and said, as you know, (laughs) Jan and Jim or whatever their names were, we have a nepotism policy and one of you is going to have to quit. And all eyes were on her. Mm. So that was the kind of newsroom that I joined. So I was used to sort of being the exception to the rule as a female reporter. So when I was the exception to the rule as a working mom, I decided this was just yet another mountain to climb, that I would prove I had the right stuff. And I would essentially make it happen in a way that would work out for everyone. 
Well, that worked fine for a couple of months, but then the editorial page commissioned a first person essay from me and one of those other new moms who chose not to come back to work. So they had us write opposing essays that ran on the op-ed page oh, about no. why, in my case, I came back to work mm-hmm. and in her case, why she chose to stay home. Now, remember, this is now 1980. We don't yet have PCs. We're still writing our stories on typewriters. So the mm-hmm. drawing that illustrated these two op-ed pieces was of a scowling baby looking at a typewriter with disgust. And you know that the drawing did not refer to my colleague's piece. It referred to mine. Mm-hmm. Of course. After the story appeared, my husband and I went away for a long weekend for the first time since becoming parents, left our seven-month-old with my parents who lived nearby and spent a lot of time with him. And when we got back on Sunday night, I was very eager to be with my son Monday morning, I go back to work, and on my desk is a huge folder of letters to the editor, and inside the Wall Street Journal is a full page of letters to the editor, and all these letters are escorting me for having written this piece. The ones in the folder were the ones that were too nasty to print, and Mm -hmm. most of them came from women who had chosen to stay at home. Mm -hmm. after giving birth. And they said things like, your son Daniel is lucky that you go to work every day because you're an unfit mother. (gasps) Oh, Uh, no. So I Uh. developed a splitting headache, decided I needed to leave work early, went home. And as I'm walking home from the bus stop, I pass by a friend's house. She's a school teacher, was already home for the afternoon. And I knocked on the door with tears streaming down my face. What's the matter, Joanne? She said, and sat me down and I told her everything that happened. And I said, I can't do it. I'm going to have to quit. And she was like, well, why do you like working? Would you be happier being home all the time with your son? I said, no, he would probably turn out to be a juvenile delinquent because I would be miserable. I love being a journalist. So she used a four-letter word that we won't repeat in mixed company, but it basically told me what to say to the people who had written these letters. Absolutely. And that was it. That gave me the courage and inspiration because she essentially said to me, you need to do what is right for you and right for your family and right for your career. So I did. I think that you're an inspiration and that's an amazing story. But unfortunately, even though it's been how many years since you had that experience, Joanne, Mm -hmm. people are still struggling with this issue. So one of the things that I am always fascinated with is what are other people thinking? You interviewed 86 executive mothers across the industries for your book, Power Moms. You spoke to almost all of them face to face traveling to eight states from coast to coast. And clearly that was done before the pandemic. But in the course of these interviews, what surprised you the most? So I would like to share what surprised me the most in a larger context of my first book. So when I reported Earning It, which is a book about 52 high-ranking executive women, I was quite surprised that so many of them were tall. And after a while, I kept track of this and discovered that more than a dozen were five foot seven or taller, including a woman who always insisted on wearing three-inch heels. And I said to her, why do you wear three-inch heels when you're already five foot seven? And she said, Joanne, when I became the only female executive who was a direct report to the CEO and the rest of his management team were guys, I decided I needed to wear three-inch heels every day so I could always look the guys straight in the Mm -hmm. eye. And it worked for her. They took her very seriously. So fast forward, then I'm now reporting my book about power moms, for which I not only interviewed 86 executive mothers from those two generations, but also 25 adult daughters of the boomers, the first wave of executive mothers. And I was on the lookout. Okay, am I going to be surprised by something the same or different? And it was something totally different. And after a while, I started keeping track of that. Mm -hmm. And what I was surprised by was that about 10 of these 86 women choked up or cried, or came close to tears when they were sharing a very, very powerful and emotional experience having to do with either their role as a mother, or their role as a manager, or their role as a wife. So I started keeping count of that. 
And I thought one of the more telling examples of that was a senior executive at IBM whose parents brought her here as a very young child. They immigrated from Korea. Mm -hmm. And early in her career, well, not that early in her career, she was already an executive at IBM, but so was her husband. They got an opportunity to relocate from North Carolina, as I recall, to suburban New York and work at IBM headquarters. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know anybody where they were going to be moving. She didn't have family nearby. So she reached out to her parents, both of whom at that point were successful small business owners, and asked them for ideas as to what they should do for childcare when they relocated. And her mother, without being asked by this female executive at IBM, said, your dad and I will sell our businesses And we will come live with you and we will help raise our two grandsons so that you and your husband can go to work. And Mm -hmm. when she shared the story with me, she started choking up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, why does this fill you so much with emotion? She said, because of what my mom said next. And her mom said to her daughter, your son is rising and my son is setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is absolutely beautiful. So I I choke up when I tell that story. (laughs) That's absolutely beautiful. And that's why Kara is part of this conversation, because Joanne, you and I are the baby boomers, right? Mm -hmm. So our son is setting and Kara and the other (laughs) phenomenal young women that we have at our firm, their son is rising. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. That's very generous. I think both of you women, your son is very high in the sky. Kara, why don't you tell us some of your experiences and what you've gone through and some of the differences, what you're going through and what Joanne and I have gone through. So Joanne, your book breaks down the division between first wave power moms, that's you and Jackie, and second wave power moms, the Gen Xers, and that's my demographic. But I'm at the early end of the second wave. So I think your book defines the second wave Gen Xers as those born between 1974 and 1985. And I was born in 1975. Okay, but you should also remember that two thirds of that younger wave are Gen Xers, but one third are millennials. So they're even younger women than that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm on the earlier part of that group. Mm -hmm. And I just had a birthday, so I am 46, and I have three children. I have a son and two daughters. My son just turned 11. Mm -hmm. My elder daughter just turned nine. And my youngest daughter, the baby, just turned seven. So I've got about roughly a decade of motherhood under my belt. And every day I feel very thankful that I was able to experience parenthood in the generation that I did because I have a lot of qualities that are similar to my own mom. You know, earlier, Joanne, you mentioned that at the Wall Street Journal, you didn't have any role models to look to when you were deciding to start your family. And thankfully, by the time I became childbearing age and was married and had made the decision that I wanted to create a family and thankfully was able to do so physically, I had plenty of role models. There were women like Jackie and other wonderful partners here at the firm who had already blazed the trail. But I will say there were still and are still some of these things that you've highlighted in your book, challenges that we face that still exist. So I wasn't like some of my colleagues who went before me who were afraid to put up pictures of their children on their desk or afraid to even talk about the fact that they had children. But there was still this feeling of people holding their breath when I told them I was pregnant. The number one question was, are you coming back? (laughs) Which I found (laughs) insulting (laughs) because I don't think anyone would ask a man that if he were to come into a room and announce, hey, I'm having a child. So I'm 60 
I have two daughters. Okay. They are age 27 and 25. Okay. Coming up through the ranks, uh, I got married when I was 31. I had my first child at 33, made partner at 34, had my second child at 35. So it was very busy years. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was very busy. I know busy. that feeling. Yeah. But on the other hand, though, for me, if people say, when I had my children, what are you going to do? And I said, it is not something that you have to make a decision at that point in time where I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You evolve as a parent, your relationship with your partner, your relationship with your children. So for me, one of the things that as I got older, I did like to tell the associates and the younger partners is that there is a time and a place for everything. So when my children were young, I took on assignments and I worked really, really hard. However, I didn't raise my hand and extend myself beyond typically what I would do because I needed to focus on my children. And then once they went into school, then I would have a little bit more energy, a little bit more breath, and then I would then start raising my hand for this assignment or taking on this leadership role. And then when they became teenagers, I would raise my hand for more and then find myself with extra energy and time. Kara, you will get there. Just wait. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that for people to make such decisions, well, I'm not going to do this or I'm going to do this, in a flashpoint of your life, I don't think it's a wise thing to do because there's iterations and there's parts of your life that you get back as your children do grow. I think that's a very wise insight. But the problem is that I find that particularly female lawyers like to have everything neatly organized <laughs> and planned out in advance. I so well I remember doing an event around my first book for a law firm and a 20-something associate said, my husband and I have figured out exactly how many years apart we want our children hmm. and what age we are going to be at the birth of each child. Should I alert my supervisor at this law firm about this? And I said, oh absolutely <laughs> not. For one thing, your mindset may change. You may decide that one is plenty because of where your career is going, or you may decide you want more than the two or the three you were about to alert your supervisor about. This is a very personal and private decision. And as yes. Jackie wisely pointed out, things are going to change and evolve mm -hmm. both in terms of your family dynamics and your career. And you mm -hmm. got to be adaptable. And you have yes. to be willing to know that it's not always going to be this terrible. It may actually get harder, but it also is probably going to get easier in many respects. And that's, that's right. why having role models of women who have done it before and can say, well, here's what worked or here's what didn't work, or here's how I was able to get to be partner in between two, rather, maybe they weren't so difficult, but nonetheless, pregnancies. And therefore, we can all pay it forward and benefit from our prior colleagues' success and insights. I'm so glad you said that, Joanne, and I completely agree. Just like I had the benefit of speaking to women who had gone before me, I now make a point of making sure that every woman in this firm knows that I am a resource for them if they want to pick my brain about how to go about these things. I think one thing that's changed for the better just in the working world generally, is our ability to talk about these things. That's how the conversation went when I told my direct supervisor that I was expecting my first child. I called him into my office. I had him sit down in a chair next to my desk. And I said, I have some news. And he grabbed both hands of the chair <laughs> and leaned toward me. And I said, I'm 13 weeks pregnant. I had passed the 12 week mark. I was really excited to be able to be talking about it. And he slumped and said, Oh, thank God. I thought you were going to tell me you were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Well, in a way, I am. I'm going to be taking my parental leave, but I'll tell you right here and now, I expect to come back and I want to stay on the path that I'm on. And I don't know how this is going to change my life because I've never done this before, but here's my current plan. But I reserve the right to change it after this human being comes into my life. 
That's a great point because I think that just setting the expectations and knowing that you're going to come back. I think for my generation, when I started having kids and when I was in law school, I graduated from law school in 1985. Half the students in my graduating class from law school were women. So it's not a pipeline issue where I keep hearing some people say, well, there's a pipeline. I'm like, no, we've had this pipeline for 35 years. So you can't tell me this is a pipeline issue. But over the course of the next 10 years, the majority of the women decided for various reasons to quit the practice of law. So one of the things that I do, and I'm a big believer in this, is that for women, it is important to keep your foot in the game. Because if you look at the arc of a career, Joanne, as you and I know, it's 30, 40, 50 years even. But Mm -hmm. the arc of hands-on mothering before the kids start to break away and create their own selves is teenage years especially once they get their driver's license, and then definitely when they go to college. So if you withdraw from the workforce altogether, it is difficult to get back in. And if you do, it's definitely not at the level at which you left it. So for years, my non-working mom friends would always feel sorry for me because I was always late to my daughter's school for an event. I was always a little harried. Okay, I was a lot Mm -hmm. harried. Mm -hmm. However, (laughs) as our kids all started to get older and I had remained working as an attorney, and they then wanted to return to the workforce and they tried, they realized that they had difficulty in regaining that foothold, which they once Mm -hmm. had. So again, I'm not saying you have to stay in big law. My path isn't for everyone. But whatever you want to do, if you can just hone your skill set and figure out a way to somehow stay relevant, that is the idea. The idea is to keep your foot in the game so that when your kids break away and you decide you want to come back, what you want to have are options. You do not want to have all the doors closed. And for me personally, it was after my kids hit these benchmarks that I had more energy and more breath that I was able to literally flourish in my practice and in my position in the firm. But I also think employers, whether it's a law firm or anybody else, can do something to keep connected to women who choose to take off for a couple of years to raise their family. It's very common in the management consulting industry, for instance, Mm -hmm. for there to be alumni organizations in which Mm -hmm. they have not only social events, but ways to keep your skills current, even if it's on a reduced part-time basis and you do it at your own pace. There are also many companies that have instituted returnship programs in which individuals, whether it's a mom or a dad or someone who's been caring for an elderly parent who have been out of the workforce for a couple of years, essentially have a year-long returnship in which mm-hmm. they're paid and they are essentially brought up to speed on the technical skills or whatever are the gaps in their professional training because they've been away. And at the end of that year, they've each had a chance to look each other over whether it's a place they worked at before or not and decide whether to get hired permanently. That's great and very innovative. And something that I think we're seeing more and more in our industry as well. In preparing for speaking with you and asking you questions today, Joanne, I thought about how much has changed for working mothers in just the 10 years that I've been a mother. Uh We've talked about some of the things that I faced when I was first expecting and starting my family. But between then and now, there's been so much wonderful forward momentum, and lots of beneficial things. So by way of example, I'm sure this is in great relief compared to yours and Jackie's experience, but when I came back to work after each of my children, it was important for me, and it's not for everyone, but it was important for me to continue to nurse my children. I was at work for eight or 10 hours, so I needed to pump. And I remember the four years in which I had three children and I was nursing all of them for a year or more, I was pumping in the oddest, strangest, (laughs) most bizarre places all over this building and in airports and just all over the place because this was a commitment I had made to myself and my children. But now, the last maybe half a decade, there are wellness rooms in every office space in New York City now. Exactly private places, there are these little pods in airports where moms can go and nurse their children or pump in privacy. So there's been a lot of good progress, I think, over the last decade or so that wasn't even thought of when I began having my family. But to your point, one of the younger executive moms I interviewed for the book 
who works for a management consulting firm and was doing the exact same thing. This was after her first child was born. She found it really, really tiresome to carry not one suitcase, but two suitcases running through airports after a business trip because one suitcase was filled with the milk that she had pumped. And one time it leaked and she had clothing in that suitcase. (laughs) So when she got back, she was complaining about this to a law firm client And he said, well, at our law firm, we ship home the breast milk for our associates and partners who must travel, who are nursing mothers. And this management consultancy executive thought, well, this is a fabulous idea. So it just so happened they had a working parents employee resource group at Mm -hmm. that company. And the executive sponsor was a boomer mom who she went to and got her essentially to advocate for a pilot test of this idea and the pilot worked fine. And then it rolled out nationwide right around the time when she was about to give birth the second time. I love it. So by the time she came back from the second maternity leave, she could ship the breast milk home. So this is to me the pay it forward Mm. that not only the boomer moms are doing, but now the Gen Xer moms are doing by essentially taking their own personal experience and trying to figure out a way to come up with a broader company-wide solution that benefits everyone. Mm-hmm. I love it. I would have loved that in 2010 when I was on trial for three weeks and I froze the milk in my hotel room. No, it was fine because I was just pumping and freezing and pumping and freezing. You must have had a very large refrigerator. I actually spoke to the hotel staff and was like, this needs to go in your kitchen freezer. <laughs> this is like <laughs> liquid gold. I need this. And I was going home and I did have those same two suitcases you just described, Joanne. And one of them was filled with breast milk. And when I was coming back, the TSA folks looked at the breast milk and they said to me, where's the baby? And I looked at them and I said, are you serious? If I had the baby, why would I be smuggling all this milk back home? (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, my God. So, Joanne, when we were preparing to speak with you, one of the things that struck Jackie and I was how technology has really helped with parenting. And what I mean by that is it's really afforded a flexibility for my generation and the millennial generation that I don't think existed for yours or Jackie's. Yes. That is absolutely correct. Frankly, is one of the three factors that I cite in the introduction of the book as to why your generation is having an easier time at juggling the issues of family and career. And that is the advances in technology. When you have slow dial-up, you're not going to be able to do a lot of work outside the office. Or Joanne, more than just slow dial-up. I remember when I was an associate and I would then go home, put the kids to bed, do the whole kid thing. Then I would get back in my car, drive back downtown to my office because we had a graveyard shift of word processors because they're working on documents all night long. So I would go back to the office, mark up my document, leave it with them so they could work on it overnight, get back into the office at the crack of dawn and the document would be at my desk. So that's a high hurdle at eight o'clock at night to get back in your car. So then with technology though, what care and the Gen Xers and Millennials have is they have technology where they can work from anywhere and everywhere. Yes. But it's also a, a double-sided, double-sided sword, sword right? Yeah, definitely. I was about to say definitely. that. Definitely. the words out of my mouth. Absolutely. You can work wherever, whenever, but that means that you're never able to be like, okay, I'm done. Turn off the right. computer. I'm going to focus on my children. That is a challenge that this next generation is going to have to work out. Yeah. Because as we have seen during the pandemic, when all of us have been sitting at home in front of our Mm -hmm. computers, the blurriness, there is no home, there is no work. We're all just working all the time. Or what people say, I am now sleeping at the office. (laughs) Because the office is right. I say, I'm not working from home. I'm living where I work. (laughs) Exactly. Right. And it's this whole ethos that's called always on. 
And it's one that the Gen Xer and millennial generation swears by and the boomers are aghast over. Yeah. Yes. There's one chapter in the book called Now and Then in which I ask women in each generation to both look at their own generation as well as the other generation and talk about what the generation got right and what the generation got wrong. And many of the boomers said the Gen Xers and the millennials are way too enamored of always on because they can be always on. Yeah. And they need to stop sleeping with their smartphones. Right? Well, I agree with that. As a Gen Xer, I will say maybe I'm a converted Gen Xer or something. <laughs> In the first half, like I said earlier, Joanne, I've been parenting for about 10 years. The first five years of my parenting life, I was always on. And it was only when my eldest child, who was probably three or four at the time, but verbal and able to express himself to me and looked at me and said, are you ever going to put that Blackberry down? I'm talking to you. (laughs) And I died inside. Here is my child. I'm like, oh, great. I'm always on. I'm connected and I can make sure that I'm meeting my client's needs, my internal clients and my external clients, but I can still be at the t-ball game. But if I'm not paying attention to the t-ball game because I'm writing emails, then it falls flat. So you have to make an intentional decision to create the boundaries that the technology erases. Yes, absolutely. I read this phenomenal article the other day, and they said that one of the things that we should absolutely get rid of in corporate speak is work-life balance. Because the idea that they were proposing, which I thought was terrific, is that the concept of work-life balance is misleading as it pits work and life against each other. One has to win, one has to lose. But if you look at it as just, this is your life. This is just your life. And your work is part of that life. So it's up to each one of us to decide how to integrate work into our life. And when I read that, a light bulb went off in my head because this is constant, okay, I'm at work now, then now I'm going to go home and now it's my life. But all of it is your life. I just thought it was so poignant. Absolutely. And it's why I made such a big point of emphasizing the opposite notion, the idea of work-life sway, which Mm. again was a concept Mm -hmm. I had never heard of before I started interviewing the Gen Xers and millennial women. I knew that work-life balance was an impossible ideal. It's the equivalent of that wonderful yoga pose where you stand on one foot. How can you do that for 24-7? And in fact, the one chapter in my first book about working mothers was called Manager Moms Are Not Acrobats, to that very point (laughs) that work-life balance is a total impossible ideal. And the idea of work-life sway is we accept the fact that we are a whole person and that when we need to be 110% focused on job and work demands, we will do so. But if life intrudes, we're not going to give ourselves a big hard time about it. We're just going to sway out of work mode and into family mode and vice versa. I think that's wonderful advice, Joanne. And this goes back to the point of having models, having trailblazers like you two who have gone before. I remember as a baby lawyer, my first year here at the law firm, there was a senior female partner who had three children who was super successful, looked up to by everyone. And she, in a luncheon with the women lawyers in the office, said, I want to let all of you know, you're never going to be a 100% A-plus mother and wife and friend and lawyer and all these things at once. It's not possible. There are days when you're going to be the best lawyer you've ever been. And on that day, you may be, you know, a B-minus mom (laughs) and vice versa. And Her just saying that, that you cannot be all things to all people Mm -hmm. at all Mm -hmm. times, really resonated with me and helped me to get to a point where in my own constellation of being a wife, a mother, a lawyer, a friend, to be able to forgive myself for not being 100% all the time for all those things. And that's also why I include a chapter in the book 
called Working Mother Guilt, 10 Hacks to Get Rid of Working Mother Guilt. <laughs> I could have used that chapter, Joanne. I could yeah, have used well, that chapter. I could chapter. have used this whole book, but it wasn't smart enough to write it <laughs> many years ago. But here's the irony. I've been interviewed for many podcasts by working dads, and they often ask me, what are some of the hacks for Working Mother Guilt? And I ask them, have you ever had Working Father Guilt? And to a man, they say, yeah, well, there have been Johnny's play where I came in after he had his great soliloquy or whatever. And I felt badly about it, but I didn't feel working father guilt. But gosh, when my wife would show up late for the baseball game, you know, I didn't hear the end of it in terms of her hand wringing afterwards. And that all gets back to uh, mm-hmm. the persistence of unconscious bias and mm-hmm. gender stereotypes which even the younger generation of executive moms is still struggling with. It was epitomized by this woman who comes back to work about five years ago after her first maternity leave, and she's a VP at a major PR firm, and male and female colleagues alike say to her, how do you do it all? And her answer was, I don't. Don't. I have a very support. (laughs) Whenever they ask me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I have a very supportive husband. I have a wonderful child care provider. I have nearby family members who I can rely on in a pinch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she was really offended that five, six years ago, she's coming back from her first maternity leave and still getting asked this question of how do you do it all? They don't ask new dads that question. No, you don't, do no. we? No. Before we run out of time, I would love for you to talk a bit about when you were talking to the daughters of these women leaders and whether they either embraced or rejected the decisions and having to be a daughter of a trailblazing working mom. I think it's very hard to be the daughter of a high-achieving mother whether she works outside the home or not. Mm -hmm. It's nevertheless a role model that you admire, but are frankly intimidated as to whether you're ever going to be able to imitate. And at the same time, these women who I interviewed who were successful executives, and whether they had become executives or not when their children were very young, they were executives at the point, and for the most part, when their daughters were becoming adolescents and Mm -hmm. heading off to college. They wanted, in some cases, the daughters to learn from their mistakes. And they wanted the daughters to major in the same subject as they did and go to their alma mater and enter the profession that they did because the mother felt that they could grease the wheels. And many of these daughters not only did not want to be like mom, because they saw how stressful being an executive had been, they didn't want to be like mom for the same reason all of us don't want to be like mom or boys want to be like dad. We all want to be our own Own person. person. We all want to find our own way in the world. But then fast forward, when they're getting out of college and entering the workforce, so many of these young women who, for the most part, are in their 20s, when I interview them, discover they have this secret weapon. And it's their mother, their highly successful executive mother, who knows how to navigate the world Mm. of work, who can tell them about the subtle forms of gender discrimination, who can open doors, who can make key introductions, who can critique their LinkedIn profile, who can make Mm -hmm. sure they have a LinkedIn profile when they finally get to high school, and who are so impressed by what their mothers are willing to do and to go to bat for them, whether it's over a promotion decision and how to raise their hand or how to reprimand someone who's reporting to them, that they've spread the word to all their BFFs and suddenly their mother's in great demand and has to say, hey, I got a day job too. But so many of these executive moms are helping their daughter's friends as well. I have to tell you, I think that for me has been one of the most emotionally satisfying parts of my life and my work as a working mother is that when my daughters were younger, there were always a little myth that I couldn't be the library helper. I could never be the chaperone on a school (laughs) Mm -hmm. trip or whatever. But once they were finishing their education and starting to figure out their paths in the working world, I realized that they were calling me more and more often. They were actually listening to me, which they may not have listened to me when they were teenagers. They're saying, Mom, here's a cover email. Can you just take a quick look at it? Mm -hmm. So my second daughter spent the two years after graduation from college working on Wall Street at one of the very traditional investment banking companies. Actually, she'd been there for about a year, and she called me. She was super excited. She says, Mom, Mom, I'm doing really well. I go, that's great. She goes, so they've asked me to run the summer program. I go, oh, they did, did they? I said, sweetheart, I said, how many hours a day are you working right now? She goes, well, I'm getting like four hours of sleep a night. I go, okay. 
So they now want you to take care of all these summer kids from colleges and run the summer. Yeah, mom, it's a huge feather in my cap. I said, okay. So in your group, as all the first year, your peers in your group in this company, what's the breakdown? She goes, well, it's about 60% guys and 40% women. I go, okay. I said, I want you to turn it down. Why? I said, because yeah. it is kitchen work. I said, it is work mm-hmm. that they typically give to women because they know you're going to take care of it. You're responsive. You're on top of things. You're all these things. I said, I want you to turn down because number one, I'm worried about your health. You don't have any other spare hours in the day. And number two, this is not something that you have the time or the energy for. I said, I just want you to turn it down. She was like, oh, whatever. So she did. <laughs> so a couple of weeks later, wow. she called me back and she said, that was the best advice you ever gave me. And I said, why? And she said, well, I turned it down. And they were like, oh, okay. And then I said, oh, let me guess. They gave it to another woman. She goes, yeah. And she's miserable doing it. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, statistically, they should have given it to a guy, right? Because if you look at 60, 40 breakdown of genders in her class, mm-hmm. but they gave it to another woman. Mm-hmm. So these are the kind of pitfalls and these are the situations that... Because of the experience that Joanne, you and I have had and care that you're having, we can help our children navigate as they start entering Absolutely. the workforce. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, gosh, we're almost at the hour. So Joanne, really appreciate the time. This has been such a great conversation. I feel like we could talk Absolutely. for hours and hours longer. Oh my gosh. It's been so much fun though, to get the two generational perspectives <laughs> from both of you as well, because it totally shines a light on what the book's about, which is the joys and the pitfalls that both generations have experienced and how we're learning from each other, because the boomers are certainly learning from the Gen Xers and the millennials as well. Absolutely. So from my standpoint as a boomer watching Kara and the rest of the young women associates and partners develop their style, develop their own trails, it's really been for me very heartwarming because again, when you and I were coming through, there weren't that many. And now behind me, I see so many amazing women, women leaders in their fields. So I feel like we've done our jobs, hopefully a little bit better than we thought we were going to do. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Joanne, a heartfelt thank you. And Kara, look yes. forward to seeing you one of these days when I make it out to New York. I can't wait, Jackie. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you so much, Joanne, for being with us today. All information, content, and materials contained in this podcast are for general informational purposes only. This podcast is intended to be a general overview of the subjects discussed and does not create a lawyer-client relationship. Statements and opinions are those of the individual speakers and participants and do not necessarily reflect the policies or opinions of DLA Piper LLP US. The information contained in this podcast is not and should not be used as a substitute for legal advice. No listener should act or refrain from acting with respect to any particular legal matter on the basis of this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. This podcast may qualify as lawyer advertising, requiring notice in some jurisdictions. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. DLA Piper LLP US accepts no responsibility for any actions taken or not taken as a result of this podcast.